Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon once again. May I introduce you to the management team from Maruti Suzuki. Today we have with us our CFO, Mr. Ajay Seth. From Marketing and Sales, we have Member Executive Board, Mr. Harish Kalsi. Senior Executive Director, Marketing and Sales, Mr. Shashank Srivastava. From Corporate, Executive Director, Corporate Planning and Government Affairs, Mr. Rahul Bharti. General Manager, Corporate Strategy and Investor Relations, Mr. Nikhil Bias. From Finance, we have Executive Director, Mr. Pradeep Gav. Executive Advisor, Mr. Didi Goel, and Executive Vice President, Mr. Sanjay Mathur. The con call will begin with a brief statement on the performance and outlook of a business by Mr. Seth, after which we will be happy to receive your questions. May I remind you of the safe harbor? We may be make, making some forward-looking statements that have to be understood in conjunction with uncertainty and the risks that the company faces. I also like to inform you that the call is being recorded and the transcript will be available at our website. I would now like to invite our CFO, Mr. Seth. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Pranav. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you and your families are healthy and safe. The third wave of COVID is posing challenges for the country at large. We are following all government protocols and taking all precautionary steps in the best interest of employees' health and safety, including that of our value chain partners. Let me start with some highlights of our product offerings and our company initiatives. We exported 205,450 vehicles in calendar year 2021. It is the highest ever exports in any calendar year by the company. In the calendar year 2021, eight of the 10 best-selling passenger vehicles were from Maruti Suzuki. We are deeply grateful to our customers for choosing Maruti Suzuki as their most preferred passenger vehicle brand. One of the notable aspects in quarter three was the launch of the India's most fuel-efficient fuel car, all-new Celerio. We are witnessing a good initial response. The new Celerio has a fuel efficiency of 26.6 kilometers per liter, and its CNG variant has a mileage of 35.60 kilometer to a kilogram. Malti Suzuki Bellino is the fastest selling premium hatchback car to cross a million unit sales. Malti Suzuki Super Carry, the country's most powerful mini truck, recently achieved the record milestone of 100,000 units of cumulative sales in just five years of its launch. Malti Suzuki's state of the art online car financing solution has received a phenomenal customer response. Maruti Suzuki Smart Finance Platform has burst cumulative INR 65,000 million auto loans to over 1 lakh customers within 9 months of its launch. Taking a step towards circular economy, Maruti Suzuki and Toyota Tushu Group Group's Vehicle Scrapping and Recycling Unit commenced operations. The facility offers hassle-free end-to-end solution for customers to scrap vehicles in a safe and environment-friendly way with a capacity to scrap and recycle over 24,000 vehicles annually. Continuing on the path to promote the culture of safe and responsible driving in the country, Institute of Driver and Traffic Research was inaugurated in Chhattisgarh. This is the eighth IDTR in the country managed under our CSR program. Coming to the business environment that prevailed during the third quarter, the company continued to experience shortage of electronic components, especially during the quarter marked with festive period, when the demand for cars usually remains good. An estimated 90,000 vehicles would not be produced during the third quarter owing to the global shortage of electronic components, mostly corresponding to the domestic models. Though still unpredictable, the electronic supply situation is improving gradually. The company hopes to increase production in Q4, though it would not reach full capacity. The inquiry bookings and retail sales in third quarter has shown an improvement sequentially. Enablers such as finance, availability, and interest rates continue to remain favorable. On cost side, the commodity prices increased significantly over the course of last one year and has been the most adverse factor impacting the net profit. 
The company made maximum efforts to absorb input cost increases, offsetting them through cost reduction and passed on a minimal impact to customers by way of car price increase. Overall, during the third quarter, adverse commodity prices, lower volumes, and lower non-operating income compared to that of the same period previous year have adversely impacted the profit performance. Coming to financial results, Quarter 3, the company sold a total of 430,668 units, lower than 495,897 units in the same period previous year. In the domestic market, the sales stood at 365,673 units in the quarter against 467,367 units in Quarter 3 last year. In the quarter, the company clocked the highest ever exports of 64,995 units as compared to 28,528 units last year, same quarter. This was also 66% higher than the previous peak exports in any quarter three. During the quarter three financial year 21-22, the company registered net sales of INR 221,876 million compared to that of INR 222,367 million in the same period previous year. The net profit in this quarter came down to INR 10,113 million compared to INR 19,414 million in the same period previous year. Comparing nine months, the total vehicle sales during the nine months period were at 11,63,823 units this includes domestic market sales of 993,901 units and exports of 169,922 units. In the corresponding period previous year, the company registered a sale of 965,626 units, comprising of 905,015 units in domestic market and 60,611 units in the export market. During, the, uh, during this period of nine months, the company logged a net sales value of INR 582,841 million compared to INR 436,035 million in the same period previous year. In this period, the company made a net profit of INR 19,274 million as against INR 30,636 million in the same period previous year. We are now ready to take your questions, feedback, and any other observations that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question two assembles. The first question is from the line of Pramod Kumar from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity, sir. I have two questions. First is on the market share bit and second one is on hybrid. So on market shares, uh, I just wanted to understand uh, 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 whether we still uh, kind of use a, a hold a 50% market share threshold which Suzuki has put out in their medium term plan and even for 2030. Uh, so does the market share target still hold good for us uh, given the market shares between what we've seen in the last couple of years? So uh, uh, that was like the first question on the market share side, sir. Yeah. I request Shang San to answer this, so he'll answer the question. Thank you, uh, Pramod. So, if you look at the figure for December, the market share uh, for wholesale was 48.3%, and for retail, it was 49.9%, very close to the 50% mark. However, if you look at the cumulative figures for, so far for the year, the market share is just around 44%. So, I think uh, uh, judging by that, uh, it does appear that if uh, uh, while December market share is close to 50%, but cumulatively it might be difficult 
to reach that 50% at the end of the year, given the current production scenario. Uh, however, next year, uh, in, in the years uh, forward, uh, I think it's uh, still quite feasible for us to target 50% market share, and that's what we plan to do. And the reason I ask that, Sakan, Sakan, is that uh, uh, we are still not participating in the uh, uh, there are meaningful portfolio gaps in the smaller SUVs and the mid-size SUV and uh, other categories. So, uh, and given that you are pretty confident that 50% uh, is quite feasible in the next year, itself, uh, probably even the entire launch pipeline may not be active. So, with all the portfolio gaps getting filled, is there a possibility that we could even reach the 50% mark in the medium term? What was the last time? Reset. Reset the 50% market share. Uh, yeah. All the portfolio gaps getting flooded. Yes, yeah, surely. So if you uh, promote, if you look at our market share up to December for hatches, it is um, 67%. If yeah. you look at the passenger cars, it is 62.5%. If you see the MPVs, there we have the XL6 and the Artiga competing against the Nova Triber, etc. It is 64%. And for the vans, it is 95.6%. So uh, obviously, in all these segments, uh, market share being above 65% or thereabouts, it's the SUV space which has pulled us down. And as you said, yes. while uh, the entry SUV, which is 50% of the SUV market, we have we are the market leader because we have the Brezza. And uh, uh, yes, we have a weakness in the mid SUV segment currently. And we hope to address it uh, going forward by expanding our portfolio uh, in, in this very critical category. And Shashank, before I let you go, one follow-up. Uh, is the general understanding that SUVs are inherently higher, have command higher margins than other categories given the pricing differential versus the equally spent and equally taxed car? Is the industry notion generally right uh, in India as well? Uh, uh, actually, uh, there is, uh, the, I don't know the cost structure for other uh, companies, but generally that may not be true uh, yeah, for, for, for the, um, uh, uh, any particular segment. It all depends on the competitive scenario and the pricing, which is, uh, we see in the industry today. Fair enough, sir. And uh, I'll thanks a lot for that. And the second one is on hybrid. Uh, 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 is there anything which you would like to share at this point of time? Because given the plans, uh, what you have looks like you, uh, as a company or as an organization, are kind of quite committed to that technology despite lack of uh, uh, government uh, uh, fiscal support. Uh, so in that sense, just want to understand what is that uh, 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 the, the use case for the consumer you see with hybrid, uh, which is giving you that kind of a confidence to kind of still pursue that technology, while uh, practically everyone else outside of Toyota Suzuki is uh, pivoting to an EVs in a big way, uh, even in the short to medium term. So if you can just help us understand the thinking and the rationale behind that, that would be uh, very helpful. So Rahul, uh, would you like to take this? Sure. <clears throat> See, uh, while uh, one will be co uh, focusing on all technologies, including EV, including hybrids, and others also that we have not uh, discussed at the moment, However, given the high upfront cost of batteries, given the limited uh, uh, you know, charging infrastructure network in the country, we do think that at least for the medium term, hybrids will be a very powerful solution. They are scalable. They do about 40% of the job of an EV in terms of CO2 reduction, in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency. But they are probably 100 times scalable. So in the medium term, they will be a good option. And of course, EVs also have to be pursued uh, uh, for the long term. So all options have to be worked upon. And uh, uh, Rauzan, any timeline as to when do you debut the technology in the Indian market? Uh, I'm not looking for quarters. I'm like saying just... Let's keep the excitement. Let's keep the excitement. Uh, fair enough. Thanks a lot. And uh, wish you that all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amin Pirani from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question was mostly on the raw material side. Uh, this quarter, we have seen a sequential decline in raw material sales, and even on a uh, raw material per vehicle basis, the uh, the costs have come down. <laughs> So can you help us understand as to any particular commodity that has helped or that has there been a reset in the steel or aluminum contract with the suppliers? 
So there has been a marginal improvement in commodities compared to the second quarter. Uh, especially the precious metals uh, have seen a decline compared to where they were in Q2. Uh, although steel has shown some rise uh, in Q3 as well, but we are now hopeful that moving forward we will see some correction uh, in the steel prices as well as uh, the precious metals will remain at the levels where they are. So, so. Some impact of commodity uh, reduction has come in in quarter three, and we expect some more to come in in quarter four if the steel prices uh, come down, which we have witnessed in the month of January. So that's the trend on commodities at this point in time. And uh, can you remind us as to uh, how often do your steel contracts get? Is it like six monthly? Uh, because uh, while they fell in December quarter, global steel prices are again up. So, you know, what's the lead and lag here? We can help us understand. We generally do it for half year, uh, but it sometimes, depending on the market volatility, we can do it for shorter periods as well. Okay, okay, understood. And and just one more thing on the uh, currency. Uh, can you just remind us what is your uh, you know yen exposure? Because obviously royalty is now fully uh, in rupees. So what is the uh, yen exposure uh, as we stand today? Our direct yen exposure is now reduced to about 30 billion yen. Approximately 30 billion yen. Okay, okay. And, and on a, from the vendor side, uh, like uh, you used to mention at a percentage of revenues, you know, what is the extent? So there uh, we have an exposure of about 50 billion yen, uh, thereabouts. Okay, so 30 plus 50, direct the thing. That's right. That's right. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back. This is only the yen exposure. There would be some exposure which is also on the dollar imports and the euro imports, which uh, uh, is not counted in the yen exposure, but they would not be as large. The euro, for example, the euro exposure is about 68 million euros in our case direct and 90 million euros in case of vendors. And similarly, there will be some exposure on the dollar side also. And that would be an offset on the export, right? Export is mostly yeah. dollars. So now we have a significant natural edge because exports have gone up quite a bit. So on the direct side, we have virtually we are surplus on dollars. However, if we if we include indirects, then of course we have a, a bit of a deficit uh, dollars because yen also has two legs. It's dollar yen and dollar rupee. So so to that extent, uh, we have a reasonably good edging now, natural edging now. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kapil Singh from Namura. Please go ahead. Uh, my first question is on demand. If you could share the outlook for industry growth for FY23, and I would also like some perspective on the medium term growth. Uh, I mean, beyond FY11, whichever way we slice or dice the data, industry hasn't really grown much. You know, it's not even been a 5% CAGR, even. You know, whichever period we choose, we need to take 2012 uh, to 18 or uh, thereabouts. So, once these, uh, you know, ba base effects go through, uh, let's say next year, you know, what what is the kind of medium term CAGR you are looking at, and why has it been below potential? Also, to add some perspective on the regulatory costs, uh, uh, we have also heard about six airbags, uh, you know, becoming mandatory as a draft regulation. So uh, that would be my first question. So, sir, if you, uh, Kapil, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the CAGR, as you said, uh, uh, has uh, been declining if you take the recent periods. You are right. But uh, it's not as if you, if you slice and dice it at any time period, it's 5% uh, uh, or less. For example, if you take the last five years, it's 6.2 percent. Last 10 years, 8.1 percent. Last uh, 17 years, 9.8 percent. So uh, it is, uh, of course, it has come down in recent years, and I think uh, we discussed this in 2019-20 when it had uh, come down. Uh, the market had come down about 18 percent. It was largely on account of uh, the cost of acquisition, which was uh, because of the conversion uh, which uh, happened because of many factors, including 
the regulatory requirements of BS4 to BS6 and safety requirements. So it is uh, that which has prevented the uh, growth uh, in 1920. However, if you look at the future, which is your, uh, the second part of your question, I think we can look at uh, reasonably look at uh, uh, CAGR growth in line with the economy, which would be roughly 7 to 8 percent. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thanks. And uh, sir, the second question was uh, on the order book. We mentioned that uh, you know it, it's around two lakh uh, forty thousand plus kind of order book. And in October also we had mentioned uh, uh, you know it's more than two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, so, could you give some perspective on whether the order inflows have been affected because of uh, supply shortages also? Because there's no growth in order book despite uh, you know the production shortages we have. So, uh, actually, the pending odd bookings is what uh, is the figure you are quoting: 240,000 as of 1st of January, and currently 264,000. Of course, the, the booking inflow has been reasonably steady. Uh, uh, month on month, if you see the uh, booking inflow, pretty steady, I would say. Um, yeah, for Maruti Suzuki, I can uh, uh, give the <coughs> roughly, roughly uh, figures of around uh, uh, maybe about 6,000 on, on an average uh, uh, per day. Uh, a little bit less in uh, January so far. But uh, the buildup of uh, pending payments happens because you don't have enough vehicles to retail. That's what we are witnessing. But if you want a question of whether, uh, if you want an answer to uh, whether there has been a shortfall in the booking inflow, the answer is no, there has been no shortfall in the inflow. Okay, sir. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gundam Pitiani from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, the first question is on this, uh, uh, the uh, news flow around this airbag uh, regulation. And also, uh, we do have the uh, next set of cafe norms. So could you just help us understand how much will this translate in terms of cost and where, you know, at what stage this regulation is? So... Uh, the cafe norms, uh, I hope we are aware that Maruti is the best position in terms of CO2 footprint, whether on an absolute scale or a relative scale. And uh, uh, so we are already meeting the norm, which is supposed to come from April. Uh, the second is, uh, on the airbag issue, we are in discussion with the Ministry of Road Transport. It's not just the cost, it's the feasibility also. And uh, once we have a discussion, we'll be in a better position to, uh, you know, share the the results. Okay, got it. The um, the other question uh, I had was on this supply side. Now, um, you know, just trying to understand how how much improvement do we expect from where we were in the month of December. Um, and also you mentioned in the release that, you know, we will not reach our full capacity in Q4 as well. So I just wanted to clarify, when you look at this full uh, capacity, do you include the line 3 of Gujarat? Uh, because, you, you know, yes. December, okay. So our full capacity is approximately 5.4 lakhs, 5.5 uh, um, lakhs uh, per quarter or about 22 lakhs uh, per annum. And uh, while there is steady improvement in the uh, supply situation, we still may not be able to reach uh, full capacity because of electronic components. And of course, the general disclaimer holds true. It's always unpredictable, so we never know uh, what supply may happen in this area. It's a global uh, problem. Okay, but the December run rate you seem to be sustaining still. Um, there hasn't been any deterioration to that, right? Uh, we are better in Q4 than uh, we were in Q3. Okay, and lastly, if you could just share the uh, the royalty discount and retail volume numbers for this quarter. So royalty, yes, okay. So royalty in this quarter was at 3.6%. And uh, the discounts were at 15,200 uh, in this quarter. And what, were, uh, what was the other information you wanted? Royalty discount? Uh, the, retail, the retails during this quarter. 
details number you would have sir uh, the details uh, for maruti suzuki for this quarter this she wants right yeah Q3 retail was uh, 392171 passenger uh, plus uh, if we include carry then it is 403970 okay thank you so much thank you thank you the next question is from the line of ragunandan nl from mk global please go ahead uh thank you sir for the opportunity uh, my first question uh, on cng vehicles can you share the volume number and market share for q3 and can you talk about uh, future potential for cng penetration as increasing share of uh, cng in product mix should be market share accretive for the company yeah so cng volumes for uh, april december period so far are just uh, just around 150000 we hope to close the financial year around 237 235000 range last year the similar figure was 160000 and the previous year it was 106000 the penetration of cng for maruti suzuki is now close to it's slightly above 15% and for the models in which cng is there remember we have eight models which are in cng it is around 30% going forward uh, we do expect cng to have, continue to find traction and uh, for the next year also we have we, we think there is going to be a good growth in cng judging by the order inflow uh, the pending bookings and also the fact that the cng network is expanding rapidly across the country and the fuel prices at the, the pumps continue to be high for gasoline and diesel uh, thank you sir that's very encouraging Uh, my second question uh, company is targeting to fill white spaces ahead and some of the new products would be in collaboration with toyota uh, in a scenario where the product is jointly developed uh, would both oems launch the product at the same time or would maruti get uh, get the opportunity to launch the product first i was trying to understand whether bulk of the new model volume uh, go towards the oem who launches the product first so this is a very conscious well thought out strategy where uh, you know uh, we look at our commercial benefits uh, and uh, the opportunity of sales in the market and then we time it accordingly so uh, 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 we'll get immense benefit from this uh, from this alliance and the timing and the strategy is there of uh, got it sir uh lastly can you share the capex spends on a ytd basis and full year plan for fi22 and uh, would it be possible to share the plan for fi23 as well thank you capex for the ytd so so we have spent so far 2233 crores that's the spent till uh, december and the plan for the full year is uh, 5500 a little upwards of 5500 crores uh and then we are on target in terms of the the plan uh, for the year so there is estimated expenditure of about 3000 crores which will be incurred in the in the next three months understood and broadly can you indicate the breakup sir that's all from my side so this is divided uh, I, i don't have the exact breakup with me but this is divided between uh, the uh, new models uh, r&d expenditure uh, facilities uh, in the existing uh, capacities that we have and also uh, the additional land purchase etc that we will do as part of our uh, capital expenditure thank you sir i'll come back in the queue thank you The next question is from the line of Pramod Ante from Insert Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is with regard to new product launches. Uh, it seems because of the semiconductor challenges, some of them got uh, delayed to come through for FI22 pipeline. Uh, in that context, how are you looking at your uh, planned launches for the remaining products? Do you still maintain the timeline on the yearly launches, or are you differing the medium-term launch plans? Uh, considering that you need to maintain some uh, gap and momentum to be built up on new launches 
so the um, uh, it, it's, it's not probably uh, correct to say that the, uh, the launch plan itself has been affected by the semiconductor uh, shortage. Uh, it is generally not true, uh, and we do not uh, foresee that going forward we will change our launch plan based on uh, this semiconductor issue. Sure. Thanks for that, Shivan. Second one is with regard to exports. Uh, considering that this year we have seen a sharp jump, uh, wanted to know what is your medium-term plan in terms of taking this as exports as a proportion of uh, these sales. And uh, also wanted to get your thoughts in terms of you have also applied for auto PLI. How does that uh, fit in the overall scheme of things? Okay. So. Uh uh, we were able to clock the highest ever exports in this calendar year, and the good part is that, uh, from a demand perspective, uh, it seems sustainable. So we've gone into expansion of products, expansion of the network, expansion of the number of markets where we uh, where we are present, and all have helped. It seems sustainable uh, in the medium term so far, uh, uh, barring any surprises that may come about. And uh, the second question was on PLI. So uh, companies have applied for the PLI. And uh, of course, uh, God is in the details. So there are lots of conditions, uh, uh, lots of thresholds and other uh, parameters that will determine the total uh, incentives to each company across each product. So uh, the good part is that many companies have applied, and to that extent, there will be increased uh, uh, localization and increased production in those technologies, the list of AAT, advanced automotive technologies. And specific to you, yours is more focused on exports for PLI application or more about the because localization will come through for vendors, right? The earlier, the earlier uh, format of the PLI scheme seemed to be towards encouraging exports, but now uh, the latest version in which form it came was about import substitution or localization. So it's about localization. Okay. Thanks, Rahul, for that explanation. Thank you. It seems neutral ac across exports and domestic sales. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aditya Makaria from HDFC. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Just <clears throat> on the uh, follow-on question with uh, you know Toyota joint development. So there is a lot of news about FI23 being the big year for Maruti because you will launch you know two to three SUVs. Uh, now I know uh, directionally you will not comment on exact models, but um, can we expect something quite sizable uh, coming into next year? Uh, so, so uh, as I explained, yes, we have a um, uh, we have a plans uh, to further strengthen our portfolio in, uh, in different uh, segments, including the ones where we are currently uh, weak in. So you can expect a, a good strength of the portfolio in the coming year. Okay, that's very encouraging to hear, sir. Uh, and uh, just a second question is, uh, with, you, you did mention that the chip shortage is now gradually easing. So uh, is it totally gone now? And, you know, are we going to be working at that 2.2 million annualized fund rate if, if uh, demand is there? Yeah, so if you see uh, the chip shortage, uh, everything, and I think Rahul explained a little bit, uh, we have we have been experiencing a gradual improvement in the supply position, and it, it, one one small correction it is not with respect to the capacity that uh, we speak of, but with respect to the plan that we have, <coughs> the production uh, plan which we have. So the, the in September we were just around 40% of our plan. In October we touched around 60%. In November, we were around 83, 85%. In December, we were uh, uh, just around 90%. So uh, the situation uh, in that sense is improving. However, it is still not 100% as you can see, and we are hopeful in that in January, Feb, and March, we will continue to see this improvement, uh, uh, hopefully to be above that 90% mark. Uh, but as we have mentioned in our press release, we may not reach 100%. When we will reach 100% is actually uh, not clear at the moment because we cannot take a 
definitive view on that because it's a very complex supply chain which is involved, involving not just Maruti Suzuki, but all OEMs in India and not just India, but across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And sir, just the last question on market share because you had lost market share in the first six months due to a chip shortage. Now we see Hyundai is really on the back foot on that count. So will that also enable us now to catch up on where we actually should be at the 50% mark? Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I did mention, uh, um, you know, if we look at the segment-wise market share, uh, I gave you, I gave the figures uh, for uh, passenger cars, it is 63%. For uh, vans, it is 96%. For MPVs, it is 64%. And without the SUVs, we are around 65% of the market share. So, uh, I, I, I don't know whether the chip shortage uh, uh, for other people is going to help us uh, or, 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 or not. Um, we obviously are looking at our performance and hopefully, like in December, our retail, retail market share was close to 50%. We would try to uh, maintain that mark going forward. Sure. Uh, congratulations, sir, sir, for a good result and a very positive commentary. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dinesh Gandhi from Motila Loswal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, my uh, first question is when the data on exports and what was the Gujarat production? So, exports was at uh, 3,343 crores realization. Okay. And uh, Gujarat production in the quarter was approximately 142,500, approximately, number of crores. Great. Uh, second question pertains to uh, uh, the depreciation uh, in this quarter. It seems to have come off quite a bit. Uh, is there any runoff on this, or uh, this is the new level of uh, depreciation because the capacity addition has been done at Gujarat plant? Mm -hmm. so, so, depreciation uh, that you see uh, uh, is uh, related to MSI depreciation and the other line item of SMG comes under the lease expenses separately. Uh, yes. To the extent the assets have already lived their life, the depreciation of those assets uh, uh, would finish in that period. So it, it, it is related. So if you, if you look at both SMG's depreciation and our depreciation together, uh, it, it is uh, almost similar as it was last year, about the same number that you see, uh, 1,060 crores in Q3 last year and 1,064 crores now, not, 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 not different. And even as a percentage of sales, it is at 4.8% in both these quarters. Right. So MSL uh, depreciation will be around uh, this quarterly run rate of 6,000, uh, 640 crores, 650 crores in that range, and again 750 crore in second quarter. Yeah, that's correct. Great, great. And uh, the third question pertains to uh, uh, with respect to uh, other income, so we have seen consistent drop in other income because of uh, increase in GCQ. Uh What should be the sustainable level of other income uh, if uh, GCQ remains at around 6.5, 6.6%? Should we go back to 500 to 550 crore a quarter, or uh, it should be lower than this? See, we have done two things to de-risk. One is that we have shortened our tenures. Uh, earlier, we used to be between two to three years of papers. Now we are down to one year papers so that the risk of the market is minimized given the fact that interest rates are rising. So we are on a shorter tenure. Uh, and uh, last year we had significant mark-to-market gains because the interest rates were going down and therefore, and we were on two to three year papers and therefore the gains were significant. Uh, this year we have, on the contrary, small mark-to-market -mark -market losses Average returns on a one-year yield is now between four and a half to five percent, depending on where the markets are. So, so effectively, all these cash surplus that we carry, you should see an income of anywhere between 450 or thereabouts every quarter. Okay, got it. That's quite helpful. And lastly, for any uh, forex gains in royalty or RM cost in this quarter? Not much movement in foreign exchange. Uh, there is uh, a slight, if you compare the two quarters, there's a uh, improvement in this quarter by about 50 crores on the direct imports. So that's reflected in the material cost. Other than that, there is no significant change in uh, foreign exchange. Okay, sir, please. Thanks. I'll come fall back in chief. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kumar Rakesh from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. 
Hi, good evening, and thank you for taking my question. My first question is on the commodity inflation side. So how much of it is still uh, under-recovered for us? And in a scenario that commodity prices remain flat in quarters ahead, uh, will they will they be passing this on gradually to customers? So we have been, you know, uh, we have been taking series of actions uh, internally with respect to the uh, unprecedented commodity increase. We have worked very hard to reduce our cost. We have also been working hard to reduce uh, uh, the do the cost reduction exercises uh, on the material side vigorously. Uh, there have been price increases that we have taken over the last one year uh, to offset uh, the price increase. Although it's always a painful decision to take frequent price increases, uh, given the uh, the uh, uh, cost of ownership continues to go up, and as Shashank Khan mentioned, that uh, one of the reasons in, uh, of the drop in industry in 1920 was the ownership. In Cost of ownership going up. So, but we have taken price increase actions, and the last one we took was in January, where we have increased our prices. The impact of that will be visible to you in the fourth quarter. Uh, discounts, fortunately, in this quarter, this <coughs> has been, have been much lower compared to last year, also because of the uh, shortage of uh, cars in the in the with the OEMs. So, I think all these factors uh, will play out uh, in terms of how. <coughs> The commodity price will be mitigated. Uh, how much was the under recovery on the commodity side? Commodities have gone up on a uh, on a sequence on a last year average basis by about ten percent, right? right? And and we have and we have we have uh, done uh, uh, quite a bit of price correction as well as. Yeah, we टाइम ही लगेगा अभी मैंने आधा घंटा पहले फोन किया था तब तक आज को में था कह रहा था इसके बाद मार्केट भी जाएगा Got it. Uh, my next question was about the market share. A lot of discussion has happened on this call as well and outside as well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Mr. Shivasto also said that uh, uh, white spaces is one of the areas in which we can potentially work, especially in SUV space, to get back the market share, the overall market share. So why don't we disclose uh, the model launch plan and not specifically models, but at least quantify that the number of refreshes. Or new launches which we are planning to do this year, or a, or a longer duration of time, say five years, like many of our competitors locally and globally also does this. So can we get some indication about the model launch plan, not while disclosing any specific model per se? Uh, so I have uh, mentioned that um, uh, we have always had a very strong uh, product uh, uh, plan. And a portfolio of vehicles, uh, and uh, we will continue to do that. And I have in indicated the areas. The reason why we don't mention it uh, specifically is because um, you know we operate in all segments. It doesn't help uh, by a, a, by letting the market or anybody know which uh, segments we are appearing in, which models. So there are, for example, if you have a full model chain in a particular. Uh, model you would expect um, the current uh, uh, sales also to uh, have uh, to be affected so it doesn't help actually and that's the reason why as a policy we do not disclose uh, uh, the uh, um, the the models that will be launching in the future especially we don't make any specific reference to new models got it i was referring to just quantify the number of models you plan to launch uh, without disclosing which specifically Which so means. so there there is this question uh, which will which will always be uh, there because you know new models means what there are new brands for which you have an absolutely no um, no no background uh, or no no past history or you could have a full model change which we call FMC or you could have a minor model uh, changes which we call MMC so which to consider where it is actually you may be maybe if we give information it might be misunderstood. And actually, the market may be misguided rather than being guided. Fair enough. Uh, one final question on the capex side. So this year's capex is at a higher level compared to our recent 
uh, trend, partly because uh, we are going to make land purchases this year. So is that trend likely to continue in FI23 as well, or this land purchase related additional capex was one of for this year? So we are now working out our plans for the next financial year. So this is the exercise of preparing budgets and uh, and then depending on the requirement in the, the plants between the manager and Gurgaon and the new model launches, we will take, we'll decide and then we'll communicate to you in terms of what the next year plans are. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, that answers my question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Joseph George from IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. A uh, couple of questions. One is, um, is the comment coming in from... Uh, voice is not very clear, sir. Um, is it better now? Uh, better. Request you to come on the handset mode and go ahead with your question. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, uh, so if you look at the commentaries coming in from a lot of um, you know companies such as two-wheeler companies or tractors or recently you know smcg companies there's a buzz that uh, there is a lot of weakness in the rural markets and we are seeing that in two-wheeler sales tractor sales etc etc so uh, uh, what are uh, the uh, things that you are seeing in the rural market uh, i mean historically rural has been going faster for you compared to um, urban but uh, if you can update us on trends there especially in the context of what uh, other companies are saying thank you so in our case, the rural markets still um, uh, continue to have a strong run. And if you uh, uh, see that um, the percentage of sales of in the rural areas actually gone up a little bit in this year. So from around 41, 41.5, it has gone up to almost, uh, I mean, just short of 43. So uh, it, it does indicate the rural markets are still robust and going strong. Uh, and I think there are reasons for it also, uh, which we had been stating. Um, uh, the the Kharif crop has been uh, record. You have had good monsoons back to back. Uh, the Rabi sowing this uh, this year has so far has been very good. The MSPs have uh, actually gone up. Uh, so uh, we consider that uh, as a good sign for uh, rural growth to continue. And by the way, tractor industry also, if you look at the uh, the the calendar year, it has actually grown. Uh, on the back of um, record growth last year. Last year's growth was 27%, and till December, the growth for tractor even is around 1%. We expect the rural to continue to show strength. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ronak Sarda from Systematics. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just a clarification first. Uh, uh, what was the average uh, price hike which we uh, took in January? Uh, the weighted average is uh, close to 2%. 2%. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other question uh, for you, Shatakan. Uh, so, uh, uh, while there is, you know, uh, the uh, there are uh, the gaps in the portfolio in the SUV space, uh, but how do you balance the equation between, you know, volume market share and profitability? Uh, because as you mentioned, you know, as you go uh, towards the sm smaller or the compact SUVs, uh, the competitive intensity is higher, and you know, in a way, we uh, uh, we kind of uh, uh, the customer segment is someone who is, you know, buying a, a compact uh, car or a, or a premium hatchback, uh, where Maruti is already a, a market leader with almost 65% market share. Uh, so how do you, how do we balance this, uh, uh, the entire equation of market share versus profitability, and what, what are your thoughts uh, when the new product comes in? Uh, uh, I, I'm not uh, fully. Uh, I, I don't think I understood the question fully. Uh, probably what you were trying to say that. Um, uh, the the profitability on the SUV se uh, segment is higher. Is that what you are saying? No. Uh, uh, while there is a, a, a gap when we talk about a medium or a large SUV, uh, but when we talk about a compact SUV, uh, you know, uh, let's say in and around the Vitara Brezza range, uh, we are in a way, you know, targeting uh, the customers who are buying a compact or a premium hatchback. Uh, so, you know, how do we see the overall equation? How do we balance the equation between, you know, market share and profitability? Because that segment is highly competitive. And, you know, as you mentioned uh, in a question earlier, 
uh, the the profitability will depend on you know a lot of different factors uh, and SUVs are not inherently profitable. So how do we you know balance out the equation and uh, what are your thoughts on on the new launches in that category? So I think individually we have to look at model by model. And um, what uh, I had referred earlier to some question which was raised, the profitability obviously depends on the segment you are operating in, the competitiveness of the segment, the number of uh, models in the segment, our own cost structure and the cost structure in the industry. So uh, it's a mix uh, which not necessarily you can uh, actually um, uh, differentiate based on an entry SUV or a premium uh, hatch or a mid hatch, etc. By the way, the uh, most competitive also in terms of the number of models is the SUV segment. There are about 45 uh, uh, models which uh, are compete in the SUV space. As against hatches, there are only 19. So obviously, uh, there are pluses and minuses, and we have to look at model-wise uh, rather than looking at some uh, overall profitability segment by segment. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks. And, and a final clarification, when we say the order book of uh, around 250,000 units, uh, how much of this would be CNG? So uh, at the current uh, 264,000, uh, which is the uh, uh, total booking, CNG is 117,000. 117. 117. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, and I'm May I just, uh, you know, uh, explain what Shashank Khan just mentioned about uh, profitability and market share? What he's essentially saying is there is, uh, we don't accept that trade off so easily and so early. I think the best thing that pushes the trade off far away is excellent products. So if you have excellent products, you will not face, uh, you know, face a situation where you have to choose the lesser of two evils, either volume loss or profitability loss. I'll give you an example. You know, the Celerio, it has a fuel efficiency of 26.68. It's much higher than its nearest competitor. The CNG version has a uh, fuel efficiency of 35.6 kilometers per kg. Now, fuel efficiencies in the zone of 30s is unheard of in India. It's only Maruti who's present in the 30 plus uh, kilometer per kg club. Similarly, uh, you know, a higher network. If you, if we have a higher volume, we can sell more numbers uh, of the same model as compared to our competition. So these are the methods by which we push this trade off away. We don't accept that there is a trade off uh, so easily between profitability and market share. Right, right. So thanks for thanks for that. Thanks for that clarification. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitesh Mangal from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I want to ask you what are your uh, what are the plans on uh, capacity expansion at uh, Gujarat, and uh, I mean, what will make you comfortable or confident to go for the next rounds? Thank you. So. Uh, uh, in, the, in Gujarat, the third line is already operational, and it is uh, we have the option of two shifts also. So with that, our total capacity is 2.2 million per annum, and uh, a little bit of productivity stretch is always possible. Uh, right, but I was just thinking, so let's say if you start the next line today, it will probably take another two, two and a half years. So, uh, I mean, let's say in the next whatever, few years, when do you think you'll have to start that uh, expansion? So, uh, you know, this is where our uh, productivity stretch helps always. And in the past also, whenever marketing has uh, required, production has always uh, come up to, has risen to the occasion and they have been able to deliver. And this stretch also improves our, uh, our operational leverage and our profitability. So uh, we keep doing that all the time across cycles. Okay, thank you. And the second question is on exports. I mean, we have seen a very good uh, uh, increase in volumes over there. Last time also you mentioned that uh, there's something which should be sustainable. You talked about Toyota network, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, let's say if you think of exports two, three years out from here, what is the uh, potential uh, in those markets? Thanks. 
So as of now, whatever steps we have taken, um, I, I mentioned about the three-pronged uh, strategy, more number of products, more markets, and more density of the network within those markets. So they have uh, generated good dividends. And it is sustainable uh, uh, in the at least in the medium term. And we have to keep in mind that global markets do have a sense of uh, you know unpredictability and surprises. Sometimes some country develops some protectionist measure, some economy uh, goes up or comes down. So we will uh, we will go along the way, and we'll keep uh, we would like to keep increasing our exports. Okay, thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Jain from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. My first question is on uh, you know on, on market share. Now, uh, you know, if, if you look at the SUV segment in particular, you know, nearly 35, 40 percent of volume at an industry level is actually diesel. Uh, you know, and in that backdrop, how do we see our you know market share in SUV even with the new launches? Is CNG a viable option uh, within the SUV space at all, or you think uh, CNG will not work in SUV? Yeah, so uh, as I explained, uh, Malti's market share, uh, if you, uh, it, uh, I mean, without the SUV, is 65%. Uh, uh, so obviously that is an area of uh, um, of interest for us uh, if we have to uh, maintain an overall market share, 50% or thereabouts. Uh, talking about the diesel penetration, the diesel penetration currently in the industry is uh, around uh, 18%. But if you look at segment-wise, it's uh, quite different. Uh, and you're right, uh, you know, passenger cars at just around 2% um, and uh, vans around 4%. Uh, if you see the SUV space, there the entry-level SUV is only about 20%. Uh, it is actually in the mid-SUV that you see uh, some traction in diesel around 58% or, or thereabouts. But remember, when the, before the uh, Brezza came with that K15 um, petrol engine, uh, a, the, the diesel share of even entry SUV was about 88, 89% just a couple of years back. So in a couple of years, 88% diesel actually became just around 20% in the entry SUV. And we would expect that going forward, if you have some really good products in the mid SUV, which uh, are, are, are uh, petrol, then also you could expect uh, the, the sharp fall in the diesel percentage in the mid SUV space as well. Overall, SUV is, is in the SUV space, the diesel share is roughly about 37%, which uh, used to be about 95% just a few years ago. And by few years, I mean about three, four years back. So it has rapidly come down from about 95% to 37%, and even more rapidly in the entry SUV segment. So if you see some play in the mid SUV segment for a good petrol SUV, then you might find the same story being repeated there as well. Thank you. Right. And sir, is CNG even an option in SUV? Or? It is always an option, of course. CNG is an option in SUV as well. Sir, my second question is uh, in, on the airbags and all. Can you uh, uh, give a sense of what will be the cost implications and all if the regulation goes through in the current form? So as of now, we are not uh, getting too much into the cost. Uh, there's an implication of semiconductors. There's an implication of lead time of delivery. So it it is a comprehensive topic in itself. We are in discussion uh, uh, with MORTH, and at an appropriate time, we'll uh, we'll share the findings. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraints, it was the last question for today. On behalf of Marit